Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And I've got Andrew O'Brien, and he's coming out of the uh, New York City. Um, and he is a um, he helps clients understand burnout, chronic stress, uh, nervous system, how to regulate properly, uh, dysregulated nervous system, how to get over it. Um, all the different somatic, visceral, um, stress reduction techniques. I'm really happy to have him on the show. So, Andrew, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Krista. Christopher, yeah, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> I always love talking about uh, this stuff because it's so possible to to transcend and manage to our benefit. Yeah, I know, especially, um, you know, today's days, uh, you know, stress and burnout, these are really... Uh, serious problems. So talk about, you know, your work, how you got started. And, um, and I'm really excited to dive into the conversation. Yeah, well, how I got started was coming to the realization that I was never good at managing my own stress. And like for years, for years, I, I was, I didn't really know consciously that that's, that's what was happening. But but in hindsight, that was exactly what was happening. I, I just didn't know what to do to manage my own stress. And so because I was not able to manage my own stress, it got to a space of uh, chronic stress. It got to a space of burnout. And and over the, over the years, experienced different physical stress symptoms, emotional stress symptoms. And it got to a point a few years ago. A few years ago was the last time that that I experienced about a burnout. And I, and I said, this is it. I said, life can't be just years of stress symptom after stress symptom after stress symptom. Like there, there has to be more to life than this. And that's when I kind of like put all of the pieces together in my own life, right? And in my own life, that was, that was coming to a big realization that what I was, one of the big factors into my own chronic stress and burnout was spending time in a job that that I didn't love and it wasn't fueling me and in fact it was taking a lot out of me it was it was emptying that bucket if you will and so a few years ago culminated into into these moments where where I came to that realization the first realization is like life can't just be this number two uh a big contributor to to my chronic stress and burnout is the work that I'm currently doing and then it was once I had that realization, it was figuring out, okay, this is what I don't want to be doing. What do I want to be doing? And um, and that's what led me in this path. And that's what led me in 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 the in the world of coaching, in the world of partnering with with organizations, specifically as it relates to chronic stress and burnout, because over the years, as a way to help me manage these symptoms. I came across different pieces of science along the way. And, and what I had done over the years was, was come across these pieces of science and then, and then a few years back, put it, put it all together, put that puzzle piece together. Uh, and so I created and streamlined all of these pieces of science that I, I wish people taught this stuff in schools because like how, how amazing would that be if they did that? Uh, and, and so that was really like it was a selfish thing. Like I want this for myself, so I so I I created this. Like uh, one of my clients <laughs> called it the O'Brien Ten. So there's there's ten different things that we can do to take our power back, not live without chronic stress, not live without burnout, and so put all of those together in 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 one synergistic way uh, to help me through it. And then and then and then obviously that led me to okay. I want to be helping people in this way too, because I know it's possible to, to live without that veil. And once we live without that veil, so much becomes more possible. So much becomes more fulfilling in life. And like that to me is what life is all about. Yeah. Really great introduction. And so um, these, um, the 10 uh, items that you just mentioned, we'll get into the next. So one thing that is really interesting is, um, I've, I've always, because um, there's this term, I'm always interested in new ideas and terms, and there was this 
new thing that I read about is called nervous system dysregulation. And, you know, uh, just coming from a medical background, kind of this homeo, the homeostasis and keep everything in balance. Um, so, uh, you know, what's interesting is this dysregulation, dysregulated state. So talk about kind of that and what happens and how to get it back into the normal flux of things. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. And and we are human, right? And and so we are born with a stress symptom, stress system. We are we are walking nervous systems at the end of the day, and what that means is that there's two sides of that. We got the parasympathetic nervous system. We got the sympathetic nervous system, and we want this. Right? So whenever I'm working with with my clients, whenever I'm working with organizations, I always lead in with. Let's have compassion for these systems that we were born with because they are there to serve us. They are there to protect us. And if we're managing this stress in effective ways, we're not going to get to those chronic stress and burnout stages where we're going to be able to manage the the stress response system in a way that will honor why it's there and, and, and the purpose of it. And so the sympathetic nervous system is that the stress side of the house, the parasympathetic parasympathetic nervous system is the side of the house that is more of that rest recharge uh kind of state and so ideally the goal is to flow we're going to experience a flow in and out of 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 these systems as a way to regulate the stress system and so what happens when we are when when that sympathetic nervous system is activated and quite often it's activated often because we are also born with our friend the amygdala in the brain the amygdala is connected to our fear response center and the amygdala is constantly scanning for threats again it's survivalist and it's constantly constantly at work because it does not know the difference between real or perceived threat our job is to to say amygdala check the amygdala and say this is this is a perceived threat this is a real threat you know and 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 manage it in that in that way but the point here is that the amygdala is constantly at work constantly scanning and so it's very likely that our stress response system if we're not managing it actively will continue to be activated that's where things can become negative for us right when we get stuck there and i think this is this is where that dysregulation comes in we want to kind of disrupt that we want to disrupt that activation because when that para, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated for longer periods of time think about what happens if um you know i share this example because it truly just happened to me walking through central park uh maybe a couple months ago there was there's a period of time in the morning where dogs are unleashed and it's really really cute all these dogs are running all over the place uh, and having a blast this one particular morning i noticed this dog and it, it was charging me and it was barking and it was it was kind of like that aggressive bark and it's exactly those kind of moments where we want this amygdala to be working for us we want this this stress um, response system to be working for us because what happened in in real time without me even thinking logically about anything i put my arms up like this and i kind of shifted myself to the side instinctively knowing that this is the most vulnerable part of us and our bodies and i you know my amygdala told me like turn away because if you get bitten by this dog at least it'll be you know in a safer side of you uh that's an example of where we want this system to be working for us. If that was activated, you know, if I let that allow that to be activated for longer periods of time, what happens in those moments? Our heart rate elevates, our blood pressure increases, the adrenaline is through the roof, our digestion is impacted. So many things happen physiologically and biologically to us. Again, healthy and normal if we're going in and out of it. But if we're stuck there, if we're stuck in that activated state of stress, that's when that the, the negative health outcomes can can come our way. And that could be both physical and emotional um, stress symptoms. Yeah, really great. And then so the, the we'll talk about um, how to get your nervous system back in uh, the proper balance. But, but you 
previously mentioned to these 10 uh, must haves or shoulds that I would love to hear about and as well as for the audience. Yeah, so that's truly how. This is how we can manage our stress uh, and and regulate both of these sides of the house in a way that will serve us. And And I would say about half of these 10 might be reminders, might be things that we often overlook, but are like, oh yeah, I knew that. The other half are are might be more, oh yeah, I, I didn't really think about it like that, but that that seems to be really important. So the disclaimer that I always give when I when I talk about the O'Brien 10 is that there are no there's no order of importance here. They're all equally important. And that the other piece is that all of this applies to us as humans, but how we apply each of these categories into our life will be different, will be personalized, because we are all different. We have different you know, wants and and needs and and desires and motivations. And so how and and we're all distinct nervous systems, right? We all have different life experiences and and such. And that all impacts how we apply these these ten categories into our lives. But to kick things off, um the first one, oxygen. Our brains, as you might already know, they actually use about twenty percent of our total body's oxygen supply. And I invite you to think for a moment about how, how deeply you breathe throughout the day, is it, or is it mostly shallow breathing to hear? And, and I guarantee you that, that most of us on this, on this podcast right now are shallow breathing throughout the day. Right now, I am shallow breathing. And how important it, uh, it is for us to, to, to kind of bring these inhales down to the bottoms of our bellies to give the brain what it craves. Even mild deprivation, which is happening with that shallow breath work, can lead to fatigue, can lead to fogginess. Uh, and over time, that builds up, that adds up. We're not, we're not fueling the brain in the way that it wants to be fueled. And, and by the way, there's so many different breathing methods out there that I encourage you to explore them because they're going to resonate. Different methods will resonate with different people. I'll just throw one of them out there. One is called the box breathing method. It's where you inhale for a count of four. You're going to hold for a count of four, exhale for a count of four, and hold again for a count of four. There is science behind this method in, in uh, working with organizations that, that are generally high stress. Navy SEALs, as an example, has, have used this particular method, and they have reported um, various benefits from, from it. But there's a slew of different methods out there, even if it's just like, one deep inhale, soft belly breathing, and then and then let it all out. I also offer, what if you imagine that you're each inhale, you're you're fueling that entire brain of yours. Uh, and yeah, but the point is, there's many ways in which we can do it and 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 keeping it as deep and regular as possible can be very beneficial for us. The second category is all about hydration, water. Clean, simple water. Our brains, 80% water. And so again, even mild deprivation can lead to us going down that chronic stress burnout train. Water, how much water should we be drinking each day? That is the billion dollar question. And the answer, it all depends. The CDC does not currently have any standard guidance for adults because we are all doing different things in our day. We're all different shapes and sizes. We, we di- live in different climates. And really, it's if we're sweating more, we need to be drinking more. So I don't think that they'll ever be able to come up with one one final set of guidance. But I did connect with a couple of nutritionists who did not know each other. And both of their guidance was to keep um, see monitoring your urine color. And ideally, what we want is is to 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 keep a pale yellow urine color throughout the day. And if we can do that, each of them said, you are likely well hydrated. And we're not talking about carbon like soda water. We're not talking about any any sort of drinks mixed with any sort of additive. Just simple, clean water. I invite you to think about how much you're doing each day and 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 what color is is that urine color based on that. Third category is all about nutrition. And this is a very complicated subject. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I will share some CDC guidance on this category because that guidance is what all nutritionists really can agree on. But just to kind of throw in some science in there, 
uh, our brains are, are super connected with our guts via the vagus nerve, constantly interacting with one another. And I'm always blown away by this, this stat. Around 95% of our serotonin, which is one of our feel-good hormones, is manufactured in the gut. That manufacturing process takes place when our gut is happy. Our gut is happy when we're fueling it with the appropriate foods, the nutritious foods. Uh, and what are those foods? So the CDC recommends that we optimize the vegetables, we optimize the fruits, the lean proteins, the healthy fats, those omega-3s. Our brains love those omega-3s. The grains, seeds, getting at the fiber uh, content of foods, really, really important for our overall gut health. Things to stay away from, added salts, added sugars, alcohol, limiting and avoiding those three things. Of course, the processed foods in this country, it's, it's, it's really tough to avoid those processed foods because so much of it is processed, but uh, it's really those, those they're kind of, it's kind of like fake food. It's, it, it's really not food. And, and, and so to limit and avoid that stuff can do wonders for, for our um, gut health, brain health and ultimately our stress health. Number four, all about the sleep. And one of the, one of the main things that happens, there, there's so many benefits that happen when we get consistent regular sleep, but one of the, one of the main things I like to point, point out is, is the glymphatic system. And if, you, if you're unaware of what the glymphatic system is all about, this is a system that activates primarily during the deep parts of our sleep cycle. This, that is a system that flushes out from our brains all of the dead neurotransmitters that have accumulated throughout the course of the day, flushes that out of our brains and, and, and out of our bodies. And if, if we're not getting that consistent deep sleep, that's not happening. And if that's not happening, it's no wonder that you're waking up feeling groggy, hitting the snooze button, you know, at least five times, just low energy and, and a lack of motivation to kind of like do anything because it's, it's, it's all physiological, it's biological. And, and over time, absolutely, that can lead to, to us going down that chronic stress and burnout train. CDC recommends at least seven hours of consistent regular sleep through, for, for, for adults. Uh, we may need more, more than that. And, and it's really to honor those bodies, to, to, to honor what your body is, is, is craving and, and asking for. And, and some ways that you might want to optimize if, if sleep is a, is a category of struggle. Uh, is your sleep environment cool? Is it dark? Is it quiet? And by cool, I mean a, a temperature that, that you feel comfortable in. The point is that you don't want to wake up in a deep sweat. Uh, I actually prefer it a little bit warmer than cool because I run cold. But again, as long as we're like not waking up in the middle of the night because of our body temperature, that that's the ideal. And um, limiting slash avoiding screen time before going to sleep. The, 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 the technology, the blue light technology in these, in these devices are designed to keep our brains awake, stimulated, activated. And so if you're doing scrolling and, and such, when, when you're drifting off to sleep or wanting to go to sleep, you might find it more difficult to fall asleep. Also, not eating heavy meals within an hour of, of, of going to sleep because your body needs time to digest. Physical activity also, avoiding vigorous activity right before you're intending on going to sleep. Those are some things. And, and if you feel like you have a racing mind, which is quite possible given, given what we are, our lives and, and, and modern times and in our culture, if that racing mind is a thing for you, perhaps consider data dumping getting this stuff out of your mind, whether that's a digital note, piece of paper, emailing yourself at work so you can get it the next day, whatever might work for you, just getting whatever whatever it is out of your mind so that could create a little bit of space for you to, to fall asleep. Uh, and of course, if, if you do have, I always say don't ignore the snore. If you do have snoring going on, I always recommend to get that checked out um, by a sleep specialist because that could be a quick fix. And um, if there's any sort of medical condition involved that's disrupting your sleep, always encourage folks to, to work with a physician to, to resolve and support on that end. Uh, I mentioned physical activity. That's number five. Physical activity, absolutely critical for us. We are human. We're born to move. When we move, 
we are increasing the oxygen, we're increasing the blood flow to our brains. We're also optimizing our, our learning and memory, which is always a, a nice added benefit. Um, but it's all about optimizing that brain health. And from that CDC perspective, healthy adults, we need to be moving moderately on a moderate level, at least 150 minutes over the week. That could be split up no matter how you want, coupled with a couple of days of weight training, resistance training to get at the muscles piece. If you're doing more of the, the vigorous activity, at least 75 minutes across the week is what the CDC recommends. Uh, I also recommend checking out that CDC site because there are other populations at play here. And, and so pregnant folks uh, is a category that the CDC has separate guidance for folks with chronic um, medical conditions as well. The elderly, there's different recommendations, but what I just shared was, was for the healthy adult population between 18 and 65 is, is that age frame. So that's the first five. The next five might be a little bit more like, oh yeah, I didn't really think about it like that. And, and we'll dive into the number six, which is all about rest. Rest is not sleep, totally different category. And what we mean by rest here is truly giving, giving your brains a rest from whatever activity is that you are focused on in a day. The research currently shows that the human brain starts to fatigue after about 90 minutes of focused activity. It could be sooner than that if that activity is more intense. But on average, it's about 90 minutes. And the research also shows when we're able to sprinkle in more, more break time, we are actually more productive. We are more efficient with the task at hand. And, and when I say schedule in more break time, I'm not talking about like, all right, every 90 minutes, take a three hour break. Unless you have the bandwidth to do that, by all means, go for it. But most of us don't really have that luxury. And so it really only takes a matter of minutes to distract your brain, ideally with something uplifting, ideally with something positive. And so maybe it's, it's looking at a picture that brings you joy. Maybe it's thinking about somebody that brings you joy. Maybe it's thinking about a vacation spot that's upcoming or where you just were that that is uplifting for you. Maybe it's listening to a song that you really like. It really only takes a few minutes of distracting yourself from the task at hand and then getting back to that task at hand if it, if it still needs attention. Uh, I do work with a lot of healthcare folks out there. And so I know that a lot of people, it's impossible literally to take this break. I'm speaking specifically from if you're doing patient care, if you're in a surgery, for example, if the surgery is more than 90 minutes, I'm not suggesting that you stop that patient care to, to take this break, but as realistic as possible, whenever you are done with, with whatever it is that you are doing, sprinkling these breaks across the day can truly help us with, with that rest piece. Uh, the seventh category is all about gratitude. What is gratitude? Gratitude is, is, is when we take intentional moments to think about what we are thankful for in this life. And when I think about, when I say the word gratitude, I'm sure a lot of people automatically start to think about other people. And if that's the case, by all means, keep doing that. But a couple of other things that I like to bring forward as possible ideas and things to be grateful for are things such as um, the material things in our life that sometimes we take for granted. So maybe it's the running water that we have access to. Maybe it's the beds that we get to wake up in. Maybe it's the shelters, the homes that we have, the refrigerator that keeps the food fresh. All of these different things we can incorporate into a gratitude practice. The pets, animals, also a thing that can, that can be incorporated into this. And also you, you yourself, your unique gift skills, strengths that you bring to this world. How might you be able to incorporate that into a gratitude practice? And again, we're not talking unless you have the bandwidth. This doesn't have to be hours in your day. It really only takes a few minutes of consistent, intentional practice each day to make a difference. And what difference is that? From a scientific perspective, when we are doing this, we're actually changing the shape of our brains. I didn't mention this before, but when we're in that activated stress state, research shows that the amygdala will actually expand in size. There are MRIs that show that the amygdala expands in size and stays that way when we're chronically stressed and burned out. 
the prefrontal cortex in addition with, to the hippocampus and, and those brain parts are connected to logic, rationale, positive emotions are stored there as well. Those parts will actually shrink in size when we're actively stressed. This gratitude piece has direct impact on that. So when we are consistent with this practice, we can change that shape of the brain. We can shrink back down that amygdala to its normal size and we can re-expand the other two brain parts that I just mentioned. A really powerful category. The eighth category, all about connection. Connection with others, of course. People who we trust, people who we love. Connection with your environment, physical environment. Or do you feel like you can recharge in there? Do you feel like you're safe in there? Do you feel like you can just let it down in there and, and, and refuel? And also connection to yourself. And what I mean by that is connection to what's important to you. What are your values? Are you living life for other people? Are you living life for yourself? All of these are really important questions to ask and get clarity on. Because when we're making decisions that are out of alignment with our value system, chronic stress and burnout will be your next stop. And then a couple more categories here. Expression. This can be a, a, a scary category for some, but what I mean by expression is all about that emotional expression. We are humans. We're always going to be feeling something. There's always going to be emotions in there. And so the goal is really to acknowledge what's happening. What happens generally is we bottle up. We were not taught how to manage our emotions. We were taught to kind of like suppress and move on. We bottle up, generally speaking. And when we do that, that will actually overflow. There's a whole body of science called the mind-body syndrome where unacknowledged and released emotions can lead to all sorts of physical and emotional stress symptoms. I encourage you to read, read into that if that's of interest. But basically the idea is to acknowledge what's happening from your feelings and then releasing those in healthy ways. I say healthy ways because generally speaking, what we, what we turn to are the quick fixes that feel good. So maybe it is those sweet desserts. Maybe it is that alcohol. Maybe it is cigarettes, drugs. Uh, shopping, like all of these things are quick fixes to make us feel good, figuring out how to, how to release these in healthy ways. And there's many ways in which we could do that. One being talking to people, friends, loved ones, talking to things in nature, spending time in nature, journaling things out so many ways. And then that last category is, I like to save this for last because it's really all about having fun, laughing, what is your inner child telling you right now? If it's not out there to hurt anybody, get out there and do it, I say, because it's truly when we have fun, when we laugh, we're changing the, the, the hormones in, in our bodies. We're releasing those feel-good hormones. And that's all a part of managing our stress response as well. And so that, very quickly, at a 50,000-foot view, are the 10. Yeah, really interesting. And so how can people find you and follow you and uh, reach out to you and, um, you know, work with you, uh, you know, check out your work and so on? Yeah. So if people want to learn more, they can absolutely do that. My, they would go to my website. My website is www.themindblowingcoach.com. And if you want uh, this summarized in, in a flyer, I do have that as, as, as one of my things that you can download from my site. If you go to the, the, um, the free resources tab, there's a drop down, click on the, the free stress relief tips and, and you can access it there. And then if you are interested in pursuing a uh, possibly working together, absolutely. You can do that too. I have a free stress relief strategy session. They are 45 minutes. My booking link is also on my website. You will see, you'll see that very clearly, you know, book time, book that session with me. And it's, um, that is the way to get in touch with me. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, really, I got a lot of value out of that as well as the audience. And be sure to give um, Andrew's resources a uh, like and follow, check out his social media. And thanks so much for coming on. You are welcome. Thank you for having me again. I really appreciate it. Chris.